Morning. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for worship. Um, whether here in the building or online, you're all very welcome. Um, just a couple of wee announcements. Our Bible study uh, will be starting on Wednesday evening um, at 7.30 in the hall. There's still a sign-up sheet in the best bill if anybody wishes to join that, so please put your name down if you're able to come. Uh, Friendship Club will be on this Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Um, I don't know whether I should welcome this man or not. He's here every week, so I suppose I should really welcome him. But uh, Reverend Hastings McIntyre is very welcome back to our, pub- our pulpit today, and we look forward to hearing his message. Uh, Reverend Watson will be back on Tuesday. He was off for a week there on holiday. Uh, but if anybody requires the services of a minister in the meantime, uh, just speak to your elder or to the Reverend Ivan Hall. Pass over to Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see the sun shining, isn't it? We're going to begin, as has become our pattern, by responsibly reading uh, part of a psalm. Psalm 118, uh, and these words are often used at the Easter season. So I will read the first verse, and you read the second, and so forth. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, let us rejoice and be glad in it as we join to worship God and sing our first hymn, which Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. Let's stand and praise God. As the psalmist says, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let's do that while we pray as well. Let's join in prayer. Our Father, 
Here we are to worship you, you who created this big world and you who gave us the gift of life. You who love us so much that you gave your only son for us to show that death doesn't have the last word. And yet, our Father, we confess that we have often chosen to remain doubtful and fearful people instead of living resurrection lives of hope and of faith. By our thoughts and our words and our actions, sometimes we have rejected your love. By the things we have said and certainly by the things we have thought, we have devalued the lives of others. And we have hurt people around us, even those we love sometimes. And we have hurt you, O God, through all of this. And so we ask you to enable us to be able to reflect on our lives, to be able to recognize where we have fallen short, to have a sorrow for those things that we can come to you and ask you to forgive us for Jesus' sake. And help us to live as those resurrection people, to live no longer for ourselves, but for Jesus who died and rose again for us. The same Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, I see really we only have the big children in church today. So we'll have a wee talk anyway. And we're going to read from the International Children's Bible as we read together from um, John's Gospel, chapter 20. Last week... Uh, Reverend Andrew was talking about the names we have for Sundays, how last Sunday was Easter Sunday and the Sunday before was Palm Sunday. Uh, sometimes today is given the name of Low Sunday, and that goes way, way back in history. Low Sunday, we think, because after the excitement and the celebrations of Easter Sunday, this was the first ordinary Sunday, so the pace had gone down a bit, as it were, so it was low in England, they tend to think of Low Sunday as being for another reason. Church attendance on Easter Sunday generally is very high. The Sunday after, not so good, so Low Sunday. However, sometimes it's called Thomas Sunday. And we're going to find out now as we just read this little section from John's Gospel, chapter 20. It was the first day of the week. That means it was still Easter Sunday, right? That evening, Jesus' followers were together. The doors were locked because they were afraid of the Jews. Can you imagine yourself being with that group of people? And all the events that had happened over the last few days? And they had heard the rumor that some people were saying that the disciples had stolen the body from the tomb. So it's no wonder that the doors locked and they were supporting each other. And then we read, Then Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, Peace be with you. He didn't say, Boom, here I am. He said, Stop your worrying. Get rid of the anxiety and the fear. Peace be with you. My peace. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. His followers were very happy when they saw the Lord. Now, Thomas wasn't with the followers when Jesus came. Thomas was one of the twelve. And the other followers told Thomas, we saw the Lord. Now, it's interesting we're not told why Thomas wasn't there. Did he have a headache? 
Was he away somewhere else? Oh, maybe the house wasn't all that big and there really wasn't room for them all. So he said, well, you go ahead. I'll, I'll go to my mother-in-law's and we'll get in there and close the door. We just don't know. Anyway, when the rest of them found Thomas, they said, we saw the Lord. And Thomas said, I'll not believe it until I see the nail marks in his hands. And I'll not believe it until I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. I think we can fairly well understand Thomas's position, you know. It's a lot to take in that Jesus is alive again. A week later, so that's tonight if we're going by our calendar, the Sunday after Easter, a week later, the followers were in the house again and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came in and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, look at my hands. Put your hand here in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And we're not told what Thomas did. We're certainly not told that he actually went and put his finger in the holes in Jesus' hand. But we're told what he said. He said, my Lord and my God. Now those aren't the sort of expression that we would say whenever something unusual happened. The word Lord used in this time of the New Testament really meant somebody who was the boss. So your boss at work was your Lord. The man who owned your house, if you rented your house, he was the Lord too. And of course, if you were a slave, your master was the Lord. So the Lord meant somebody in charge, somebody who was the boss, somebody who was of a much higher rank than you were in society. But Thomas didn't leave it there. He didn't just say, yes, Jesus, I can see you're somebody very important. He said, my Lord and my God. So he was acknowledging that Jesus really was the Son of God. And that made a big difference. But I think the next verse is fascinating. Jesus told him, you believe because you see me. Those who believe without seeing me will be truly happy or truly blessed, as some other translations put it. He was talking about us. Because if we believe in Jesus, we haven't physically seen him. And Jesus is saying to you and to me, you're specially blessed because you have believed without actually seeing me. What a compliment that is to come from the Lord himself to people like us and other groups meeting all over the world to worship him today. We're going to sing, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Sing it through twice, Sylvia, will we?
A moment ago we said that today is sometimes called Low Sunday or Thomas Sunday. I had the radio on in the car on my way up and I think it was Bishop Donald McKeown from Derry who was speaking and he said in the Catholic Church today is known as Divine Mercy Sunday. That was a wee bit of news for me, I have to say. But did you, I'm sure you did if you've been watching the news over the last few days, that today is also Easter Sunday for many of our fellow Christians around the world. If you were part of the Orthodox Church, today would be Easter. And the celebrations are mighty, I can tell you, because Easter is a much bigger event than the Orthodox Church than Christmas is. Uh, and their Easter is different from ours because way back in the 1500s, Pope Gregory changed the way the calendar works. I don't understand it, I have to say. But that's the fact. So we work on a Western calendar and Eastern Europe Orthodox churches work on an old Eastern calendar. So it means that Christians in Greece and Cyprus and Serbia and Romania and Bulgaria and Armenia and Russia and Ukraine all celebrate Easter today. Can you imagine wishing your neighbours Happy Easter holed up in the basement of a building that's been bombed for the last two months really? And you know, in the Orthodox Church, their Easter celebration starts last night. They have a service that lasts about four hours. And at midnight, all the candles and lights are put out. And then the priest lights one candle and he shouts, Christ is risen. The people shout, he's risen indeed. And they all light candles from each other. And when they go outside, they light bonfires and let off fireworks. So it's not only the 11th of July that people do that. They celebrate something special on Easter Day. And in Ukraine, did you hear it on the news? People were told not to go to church because there was a curfew last night, simply to watch the service on television. I can't really imagine what that would feel like, given how important it is. And then, of course, you know, Ukraine's not the only place. There's Yemen and Sudan, Afghanistan, so many other places. And nearer home, there's the struggle with rising prices, and so many are finding that very difficult. And the election's coming up. How do we decide to do the right and the Christian thing as we cast our vote? And then there are the individuals who need our prayer because of illness or loneliness or confusion or whatever reason. Let's join in prayer. Let's pray. Creator God, you are our Father and you made us in your own image. We thank you for the gift of compassion which we inherit from you. And we think back over the last number of weeks and the wonderful generosity and bravery there has been in people trying to help the people of Ukraine. The welcome and the kindness and we just pray that these things will be multiplied by your spirit and they can bring hope and healing to the beleaguered people of Ukraine. And at the international level, oh God, we really don't know what to think. We simply pray that you'll lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth, from fear to trust, from hatred to love, and somehow from war to peace. And just as Jesus arrived and his disciples and he said, peace be with you, we pray that you would let your peace fill our hearts and the hearts of leaders and nations and indeed this big world. Nearer home, we pray for our politicians and ourselves, O oh God, that we may all ponder what is best for our whole community and be open to your guidance that genuine peace may be established here and mutual respect 
will become a reality for everyone. We pray for our leaders, that they may be open to your spirits working, maybe even despite themselves. And we pray for all Christian people involved, whether as candidates or voters, that we'll take our responsibility seriously to discover and do your will. We pray for individuals in particular need. And we mention those known to us before you just now in the quietness. We ask your special blessing on each of them. And on others we've heard about but don't particularly know. Pray for our congregation here too. Its members and leaders. And ask a special blessing on the Reverend Andrew and Hazel as they have a time of relaxation. Hear our prayers as we offer them in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue our prayer as we join to sing Your Kingdom Come, O God. Now I know you can't see all the verses as you look at it, but it's an interesting hymn. If it was actually one of the psalms, it would be called a psalm of lament. Because while the first verse is a prayer for God to act, the second and third verses are questions, where we bring our questions, our puzzlement, even our anger and despair to God. And then the psalm moves on beyond that, asking God to help in the situation. So verse 2 begins, Where is your reign of peace, O God? You promised us peace. Why is it not here? Verse 3. When comes the promised time when war will be no more? Let's continue our prayer as we join to sing. Your kingdom come, O God.
How do I know that, Willie, at the top? Oh, that helps, doesn't it? Here we go. No. Oh, we've got a half a picture. We're going down the names that we have for today at the minute. And we had uh, Low Sunday, we had Thomas Sunday, we had Easter Sunday, we had Divine Mercy Sunday that I learnt this morning. Did you know that it used to be called Quasimodo Sunday? That was a surprise to me until a few weeks ago, I have to tell you. Quasimodo. And uh, Quasimodo, of course, when you think of that, you think of the Hunchback of Notre Dame and that old black and white film with Charles Lawton as the Hunchback and a more recent Disney version of it where actually if you look at the pictures they have drawn of the Hunchback, they're remarkably like Charles Lawton in that old black and white film. Uh, it was a novel that Victor Hugo wrote away back in the 1800s, but the events described situation in the 1400s in Paris. So, Quasimodo was a hunchback who lived in Notre Dame Cathedral. How come the Sunday after Easter is called Quasimodo Sunday? If he lived in the 1400s, it was known as Quasimodo Sunday long before that. But I have to tell you how he got his name. You see, he was born deformed. And his mother thought that really she couldn't give him a very good life. So she decided she would abandon him in the hope that someone would find this little baby and give him a much better chance in life than she ever could. So perhaps in hope, and I assume with some faith, she decided a good place to leave him was in fact in Notre Dame Cathedral. And true enough, the child was found by an archdeacon in the cathedral, and he called him Quasimodo. Doesn't sound a very French name, sure it doesn't. And that's because it's not, it's a Latin name. And the archdeacon gave him that name because on Quasimodo Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, the first lines of the first words in the service were Quasimodo from a Latin prayer. Quasimodo geniti infantes. Well, I don't know how your Latin is, but mine's pretty rusty. So thankfully I've got an English translation. If it works. Oh. There we are. It's a translation of a verse from 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn infants. And the verse goes on. Who crave spiritual milk so that they can grow into their salvation. Those were the first words of the introduction to the service on that day. Quasimodo was found on that day. And so the archdeacon had him baptized and named him Quasimodo. Quasimodo, as I say, is a translation into Latin of what we have in English in 1 Peter chapter 2. And Sylvia is going to read for us now 1 Peter chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 12. And I'm just hoping she's going to read it in English rather than Latin. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, omitting verses 6 to 8. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it, you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built 
into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sylvia. <clears throat> Let's pray just as we begin to ponder these words from Scripture. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. Peter's writing here about growing up. Growing up as followers of Jesus. And he's saying that there's a parallel between the way we grow as babies and children into adults. And how Christians grow and develop as they mature. And we know that for a baby to thrive, of course they need to be fed nutritious food. And to live in a protective, loving environment. It has to be said, of course, and we've all experienced this, that babies, once they reach the f solid food stage, seem to think that food can be absorbed through their skin. You know what I mean? Where the food gets plastered, face, hair, everywhere within reach, except their mouths, it seems. And parents and grandparents come along and do a clean-up and spoon by spoon making sure it goes in. And then we polish those same little faces. And we remove the bib. And what happens? Up it comes again. And the absorbing method is tried all over again. Now we adults know of course. That the benefit of food is only realised whenever it's swallowed. If we think of Christians growing up. There is a certain amount of spiritual food that is absorbed from those around us. Subconsciously, we learn from the attitudes of the people we respect as parents, family members, people in the church, and we absorb a certain amount of those Christian values and attitudes in that way. But if it's important for a child to deliberately absorb the food, so it is for us as Christians. And uh, God has kindly given us the wonderful gift of his word in the Bible. And he wants us to feed on it so that we can grow to maturity. And our aim is to grow as healthy, mature Christians. To become the people of God, followers of Jesus, and to grow to be like him. What's your attitude to the Bible? The Bible Society a few years ago did a survey among church members in the United Kingdom. And they found that 57 people, a percent of the people believed that the Bible should shape their daily lives. A great deal, they said. 35% read a Bible passage every day. 73% of the people said that the Bible actively challenges them to live in a way that runs counter to the present culture in the United Kingdom. 60% believe that the Bible should teach us what our moral values are. 
and 78% believed that it's inspired by God. What about you? Where do you fit in? <clears throat> do you try to grow spiritually? Just as so many people run every day or go to the gym or walk in order to try to keep their physical health? Do we put the same effort into our spiritual health and growth? Do you find the Bible easy to understand? Or a bit complicated in places? When you come to that, do you try to understand it? Or do you just give up and move on? Now, I know people who read a chapter of the Bible faithfully every day, and they say that what they do is they read it, and then they think about it, what it means, and what it means for them. I know a whole lot more people who read a passage of the Bible every day, but they find it helpful to have something there to help them to understand what it means. And you can get all kinds of Bible reading helps to do that. I use the New Daylight, which is published by the Bible Reading Fellowship, which was started 100 years ago by a Church of England minister in England who wanted to help his people to understand the scriptures. So he wrote out um, little notes to help them. And if you remember the old Gestetners where you turned the things off and it was issued around and it celebrates its 100th anniversary this year. In fact, their celebration services this afternoon in a parish church in England. So I use that uh, every day. You have to pay for those. Scripture Union and various other people publish them, but you have to pay for it. My wife uses the word for today, and I see there's a few copies on the table out in the vestibule. You don't have to pay for those, but they do ask you to make a donation every now and again. So there's a whole variety of sort of physical ones you can get that uh, you can use to help you to understand the scriptures. And you can get them as apps on your phone too. And uh, our Presbyterian church issues tides, which come as an email Monday to Friday uh, with a Bible passage and devotional thought on it. It's free. And then there's another one I discovered recently from Biblica, which is uh, the International Bible Societies, and you get a little um, verse and some thoughts on it and how you can apply that to your life and how you can pray about it. I would suggest that, you know, you can find these online if you're looking, and uh, it's worth a try if you don't already use it. And uh, Peter says, really, it's time for the church to grow up, that people need to be fed, and we have to do that. Maybe you're saying you don't really have the time and you don't know how to go about it. Well, I read my New Daylight when I go to bed at night. And I read the Tides one in the morning. Some people just use one. And of course, some people read it on the bus or on the train. It's a bit more difficult if you're driving. But you can get them as audio things now that will come to you even as you are driving. So... The advantage I find of my New Daylight one is that they print the little Bible passage at the top of the page and the comment underneath so you don't need to juggle two books as you're doing it. And that's important. Just remember that the Bible was written by over 40 different people and not many of them actually lived at the same period in history. And yet there's a big story right through the Bible that tells us who God is, who we are, what God has done and continues to do for us and the likes of us, and how God expects us and the likes of us to respond to his love and the things he has done. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, or if we would like to believe that he did it for us, then feeding our spirits to grow makes a lot of sense. And the benefit is that we'll grow to be more like Jesus. And that can't be bad. Now we know that Jesus, when he was teaching, used a lot of pictures to try to explain the point he was getting across. And it seems that the Apostle Peter learnt from Jesus' example. And in this chapter that Sylvia read for us, 
we have Peter putting it into practice. We have been thinking about the growing and how the baby craves food and we as Christians ought to crave to be fed too. And he goes on to speak about living stones. Uh, he said, I couldn't find a picture, but I remember long time ago, Scripture Union had a little booklet about the church and they had a drawing which was the building of a church, let's say, Cairn Castle Church. But instead of that nice grey plaster, it was all little people, all standing on top of each other and beside each other, making up the bricks of the church. And that's the picture that Peter has here. He says that the stone that the leaders rejected was Jesus, and he became the cornerstone, the foundation stone. And all the followers are the living stones that together make the church. Way back in the Old Testament, right up to Jesus' day, the people were very certain that God actually lived in the temple. That big, imposing, strong, powerful building in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can still see the enormous stones that make up the base on which the temple was built. You'll see it when they're covering the riots that are taking place between Jews and Muslims and Israeli soldiers up on the top. And what Jesus is say, or Peter is saying here is that we become living stones. That from Jesus' day, God lives in his church and we are the building blocks that make up the church. That we are part of this way in which God lives in society using us. Together we make the church God's outpost in the world. And then he goes on to say about a chosen people. Do you remember choosing teams when you were a child? You know, somebody was the captain for each side and they chose one and the other side. I was always the pachel that was left at the end because I couldn't play physical games. I was better at falling over my feet than using them for anything else. And it's not a nice feeling being left to the last. And I'm sure we've all experienced that in some way or other. But you know what Peter's saying here? He's saying that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a chosen person. God has chosen you. You belong. And that's an important... You're a part of the team. You're included. You're an outsider no longer. And not only are you on God's team, you have a special role. He says you're a priest, a go-between between God and people. Before you were an outsider, wondering what it would be like to belong. Now he says you're an insider. Not because you worked to impress God and got chosen further up the list, but simply because of God's love and mercy. He has pulled you into his team. That makes you special. And I hope you feel it. And then he says, foreigners and exiles. Jim Reeve used to sing, and if you don't know who Jim Reeve is, well, you have to ask your granny, really. He used to sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. What Peter's urging us is to live like foreigners and exiles. Sometimes translated strangers and pilgrims. Either way, there are people who travel light and don't expect to stay too long. Do you see what this means? This means that where the world puts the great value on things like money and status, and popularity, and property, and possessions. God's people are foreigners in this world. So we ought to travel light. We shouldn't see those as the be-all and end-all. Because we are just traveling through on our way to that promised place that Christ has prepared for us. Christians should be different, and have different values. Live by God's moral code. And therefore behave differently. That's what he means. When he says that even though the people may criticize you. And mock you. They will see your good deeds. 
and acknowledge God's role in your life. I've seen that happen in work situations where even though people who stood by their Christian principles were literally mocked, they were really respected because people recognized the principles that they lived by. I suppose if we remember that first picture of the baby craving food, it really sums up what Peter's saying here, that it's time to grow up. Are you growing up? Am I? Do you see a difference in your Christian maturity as you look back over weeks, months, and years? Do other people see that growth in your life? If not, why not, I wonder? We've all seen on the news and television recently the court case between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and the sordid details of their relationship. And what way is the judgment going to come? Who knows? They just appear to be as bad as each other from what we have been shown on the television. But watching it the other day, it just struck me. If I was in the dock, accused of being a follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Or is the evidence a bit sparse? What if you were in the dock, accused of that? Makes you think, doesn't it? Quasimodo Sunday. Quasimodo Infantis, like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk so that you may grow in your salvation. Let us pray. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the height of your plans for us. And by grace we'll stand on your promises. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built. And the earth is filled with your glory. Amen. Let's conclude our service by joining to sing Church of God, Elect and Glorious which is written based on this chapter that we have been looking at today. Let's stand and praise God.
Just before the benediction, I want to say thank you to Willie for the technical skill, and you don't know a quarter of it, let me tell you, the stories that have happened this week. And thanks to Sylvia for the music and for her reading. Now, I would suggest that we keep our eyes open and we do what we're not allowed to do in church. We look around as we invite God's blessing on each other as we say the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.